Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. What is to be done? Burning Questions of Our Movement published March 1902. Chapter 3. Trade Unionist Politics and Social Democratic Politics. We shall again begin by praising Ray Bocciadiello. Literature of Exposure and the Proletarian Struggle is the title Martinov gave the article on his differences with Iskra published in Ray Bocciadiello, number 10. He formulated the substance of the differences as follows, we cannot confine ourselves solely to exposing the system that stands in its, the working class party's, path of development. We must also react to the immediate and current interests of the proletariat. Iskra is in fact an organ of revolutionary opposition that exposes the state of affairs in our country, particularly the political state of affairs. We, however, work and shall continue to work for the cause of the working class in close organic contact with the proletarian struggle, p. 63. One cannot help being grateful to Martinov for this formula. It is of outstanding general interest, because substantially it embraces not only our disagreements with Ray Bocciadiello, but the general disagreement between ourselves and the economists on the political struggle. We have shown that the economists do not altogether repudiate politics, but that they are constantly straying from the social democratic to the trade unionist conception of politics. Martinov strays in precisely this way, and we shall therefore take his views as a model of economist terror on this question. As we shall endeavor to prove, Neither the authors of the separate supplement to Ray Bocciaia Missile nor the authors of the manifesto issued by the Self-Emancipation Group, nor the authors of the Economist letter published in Iskra, No. 12, will have any right to complain against this choice. A political agitation and its restriction by the economists. Everyone knows that the economic one, one, to avoid misunderstanding, we must point out that here, and throughout this pamphlet, by economic struggle, we imply in keeping with the accepted usage among us, the practical economic struggle, which Engels, in the passage quoted above, described as resistance to the capitalists, and which in free countries is known as the organized labor syndicle, or trade union struggle. Lenin's struggle of the Russian workers underwent widespread development and consolidation simultaneously with the production of literature exposing economic, factory and occupational, conditions. The leaflets were devoted mainly to the exposure of the factory system, and very soon a veritable passion for exposures was roused among the workers. As soon as the workers realized that the social democratic study circles desired to, and could, supply them with a new kind of leaflet that told the whole truth about their miserable existence, about their unbearably hard toil, and their lack of rights, they began to send in, actually flood us with, correspondence from the factories and workshops. This exposure literature created a tremendous sensation, not only in the particular factory exposed in the given leaflet, but in all the factories to which news of the revealed facts spread. And since the poverty and want among the workers in the various enterprises and in the various trades are much the same, the truth about the life of the workers stirred everyone. Even among the most backward workers, a veritable passion arose to get into print. A noble passion for this rudimentary form of war against the whole of the present social system which is based upon robbery and oppression. And in the overwhelming majority of cases these leaflets were in truth a declaration of war, because the exposures served greatly to agitate the workers, they evoked among them common demands for the removal of the most glaring outrages and roused in them a readiness to support the demands with strikes. Finally, the employers themselves were compelled to recognize the significance of these leaflets as a declaration of war, so much so that in a large number of cases they did not even wait for the outbreak of hostilities. As is always the case, the mere publication of these exposures made them effective, and they acquired the significance of a strong moral influence. On more than one occasion, the mere appearance of a leaflet proved sufficient to secure the satisfaction of all or part of the demands put forward. In a word, economic, factory, Exposures were and remain an important lever in the economic struggle. And they will continue to retain this significance as long as there is capitalism, which makes it necessary for the workers to defend themselves. Even in the most advanced countries of Europe it can still be seen that the exposure of abuses in some backward trade, or in some forgotten branch of domestic industry, serves as a starting point for the awakening of class consciousness, for the beginning of a trade union struggle, and for the spread of socialism. Two. The overwhelming majority of Russian social democrats have of late been almost entirely absorbed by this work of organizing the exposure of factory conditions. 
Suffice it to recall Rabo Chaya missile to see the extent to which they have been absorbed by it, so much so, indeed, that they have lost sight of the fact that this, taken by itself, is in essence still not social democratic work, but merely trade union work. As a matter of fact, the exposures merely dealt with the relations between the workers in a given trade and their employers, and all they achieved was that the sellers of labor power learned to sell their commodity on better terms and to fight the purchases over a purely commercial deal. These exposures could have served, if properly utilized by an organization of revolutionaries, as a beginning and a component part of social democratic activity, but they could also have led, and, given a worshipful attitude towards spontaneity, were bound to lead, to a purely trade union struggle and to a non-social democratic working class movement. Social democracy leads the struggle of the working class, not only for better terms for the sale of labor power, but for the abolition of the social system that compels the proper tailors to sell themselves to the rich. Social democracy represents the working class, not in its relation to a given group of employers alone, but in its relation to all classes of modern society and to the state as an organized political force. Hence, it follows that not only must social democrats not confine themselves exclusively to the economic struggle, but that they must not allow the organization of economic exposures to become the predominant part of their activities. We must take up actively the political education of the working class and the development of its political consciousness. Now that Zaria and Escro have made the first attack upon economism, all are agreed on this, although some agree only in words, as we shall soon see. The question arises, what should political education consist in? Can it be confined to the propaganda of working class hostility to the autocracy? Of course not. It is not enough to explain to the workers that they are politically oppressed, any more than it is to explain to them that their interests are antagonistic to the interests of the employers. Agitation must be conducted with regard to every concrete example of this oppression, as we have begun to carry on agitation round concrete examples of economic oppression. Inasmuch as this oppression affects the most diverse classes of society, inasmuch as it manifests itself in the most varied spheres of life and activity, vocational, civic, personal, family, religious, scientific, etc., etc. Is it not evident that we shall not be fulfilling our task of developing the political consciousness of the workers if we do not undertake the organization of the political exposure of the autocracy in all its aspects? In order to carry on agitation round concrete instances of oppression, these instances must be exposed, as it is necessary to expose factory abuses in order to carry on economic agitation. One might think this to be clear enough. It turns out, however, that it is only in words that all are agreed on the need to develop political consciousness, in all its aspects. It turns out that Ray Botchide Yellow, for example, far from tackling the task of organizing, or making a start in organizing, comprehensive political exposure, is even trying to drag Iskra, which has undertaken this task, away from it. Listen to the following, the political struggle of the working class is merely, it is certainly not merely, the most developed, wide, and effective form of economic struggle, program of Ray Botchide Yellow, published in issue number 1, p. 3. The Social Democrats are now confronted with the task of lending the economic struggle itself, as far as possible, a political character, Martinov, Ray Bochide Yellow, Number 10, p. 42. The economic struggle is the most widely applicable means of drawing the masses into active political struggle, resolution adopted by the Conference of the Union Abroad and amendments thereto, two conferences, pages 11 and 17. As the reader will observe, all these theses permeate Ray Botchide Yellow from its very first number to the latest instructions to the editors, and all of them evidently express a single view regarding political agitation and struggle. Let us examine this view from the standpoint of the opinion prevailing among all economists, that political agitation must follow economic agitation. Is it true that, in general, 3. The economic struggle is the most widely applicable means of drawing the masses into the political struggle? It is entirely untrue. Any and every manifestation of police tyranny and autocratic outrage, not only in connection with the economic struggle, is not one whit less widely applicable as a means of drawing in the masses. The rural superintendents and the flogging of peasants, the corruption of the officials and the police treatment of the common people in the cities, the fight against the famine stricken and the suppression of the popular striving towards enlightenment and knowledge, 
the extortion of taxes and the persecution of the religious sects, the humiliating treatment of soldiers and the baroque methods in the treatment of the students and liberal intellectuals, do all these and a thousand other similar manifestations of tyranny, though not directly connected with the economic struggle, represent, in general, less widely applicable means and occasions for political agitation and for drawing the masses into the political struggle, the very opposite is true. Of the sum total of cases in which the workers suffer, either on their own account or on account of those closely connected with them, from tyranny, violence, and the lack of rights, undoubtedly only a small minority represent cases of police tyranny in the trade union struggle as such. Why then should we, beforehand, restrict the scope of political agitation by declaring only one of the means to be the most widely applicable, when social democrats must have, in addition, other, generally speaking, no less widely applicable means. In the dim and distant past, a full year ago, Ray Bocciadiello wrote, the masses begin to understand immediate political demands after one strike, or at all events, after several, as soon as the government sets the police and gendarmerie against them, August. Number 7, 1900, p. 15. This opportunist theory of stages has now been rejected by the Union abroad, which makes a concession to us by declaring, there is no need whatever to conduct political agitation right from the beginning, exclusively on an economic basis, two conferences, p. 11. The Union's repudiation of part of its former errors will show the future historian of Russian social democracy better than any number of lengthy arguments the depths to which our economists have degraded socialism. But the Union abroad must be very naive indeed to imagine that the abandonment of one form of restricting politics will induce us to agree to another form. Would it not be more logical to say, in this case too, that the economic struggle should be conducted on the widest possible basis, that it should always be utilized for political agitation, but that there is no need whatever to regard the economic struggle as the most widely applicable means of drawing the masses into active political struggle? The Union abroad attaches significance to the fact that it has substituted the phrase most widely applicable means for the phrase the best means contained in one of the resolutions of the Fourth Congress of the Jewish Workers' Union, Bund. We confess that we find it difficult to say which of these resolutions is the better one. In our opinion they are both worse. Both the Union abroad and the Bund fall into the error, partly, perhaps unconsciously, under the influence of tradition, of giving an economist trade unionist interpretation to politics. Whether this is done by employing the word best or the words most widely applicable makes no essential difference whatever. Had the union abroad said that political agitation on an economic basis is the most widely applied, not applicable, means, it would have been right in regard to a certain period in the development of our social democratic movement. It would have been right in regard to the economists and to many, if not the majority of the practical workers of 1898 to 1901, for these practical economists applied political agitation, to the extent that they applied it at all, almost exclusively on an economic basis. Political agitation on such lines was recognized and, as we have seen, even recommended by Ray Bocciaia Misland the Self-Emancipation Group. Ray Bocciaiello should have strongly condemned the fact that the useful work of economic agitation was accompanied by the harmful restriction of the political struggle, instead, it declares the means most widely applied, by the economists, to be the most widely applicable. It is not surprising that when he called these people economists, they can do nothing but pour every manner of abuse upon us, call us mystifiers, disruptors, papal nuncios, and slanderers, for, go complaining to the whole world that we have mortally offended them, and declare almost on oath that not a single social democratic organization is now hinged with economism. 5. Oh, those evil, slanderous politicians. They must have deliberately invented this economism, out of sheer hatred of mankind, in order mortally to offend other people. What concrete, real meaning attaches to Martinoff's words when he sets before social democracy the task of lending the economic struggle itself a political character. The economic struggle is the collective struggle of the workers against their employers for better terms in the sale of their labor power, for better living and working conditions. This struggle is necessarily a trade union struggle, because working conditions differ greatly in different trades, and, consequently, the struggle to improve them can only be conducted on the basis of trade organizations, in the Western countries, through trade unions, in Russia, through temporary trade associations and through leaflets, etc. 
lending the economic struggle itself a political character means, therefore, striving to secure satisfaction of these trade demands. The improvement of working conditions in each separate trade by means of legislative and administrative measures, as Martinoff puts it on the ensuing page of his article, p. 43. This is precisely what all workers' trade unions do and always have done. Read the works of the soundly scientific, and soundly opportunist, Mr. and Mrs. Webb and you will see that the British trade unions long ago recognized, and have long been carrying out, the task of lending the economic struggle itself a political character. They have long been fighting for the right to strike, for the removal of all legal hindrances to the cooperative and trade union movements, for laws to protect women and children, for the improvement of labor conditions by means of health and factory legislation, etc. Thus, the pompous phrase about lending the economic struggle itself a political character, which sounds so terrifically profound and revolutionary, serves as a screen to conceal what is in fact the traditional striving to degrade social democratic politics to the level of trade union politics. Under the guise of rectifying the onesidedness of Iskra, which, it is alleged, places the revolutionizing of dogma higher than the revolutionizing of life, 6. We are presented with the struggle for economic reforms as if it were something entirely new. In point of fact, the phrase lending the economic struggle itself a political character means nothing more than the struggle for economic reforms. Martinoff himself might have come to this simple conclusion, had he pondered over the significance of his own words. Our party, he says, training his heaviest guns on Iskra, could and should have presented concrete demands to the government for legislative and administrative measures against economic exploitation unemployment, famine, etc. Raybotch Idealo. Number 10. Pages 42-43. Concrete demands for measures, does not this mean demands for social reforms? Again we ask the impartial reader, are we slandering the Raybotch Idealoites, may I be forgiven for this awkward, currently used designation, by calling them concealed Bernsteinians when, as their point of disagreement with Iskra, they advance their thesis on the necessity of struggling for economic reforms? Revolutionary social democracy has always included the struggle for reforms as part of its activities. But it utilizes economic agitation for the purpose of presenting to the government, not only demands for all sorts of measures, but also, and primarily, the demand that it cease to be an autocratic government. Moreover, it considers it its duty to present this demand to the government on the basis, not of the economic struggle alone, but of all manifestations in general of public and political life. In a word, it subordinates the struggle for reforms, as the part to the whole, to the revolutionary struggle for freedom and for socialism. Martinov, however, resuscitates the theory of stages in a new form and strives to prescribe, as it were, an exclusively economic path of development for the political struggle. By advancing at this moment, when the revolutionary movement is on the upgrade, an all-edged special task of struggling for reforms, he is dragging the party backwards and is playing into the hands of both economist and liberal opportunism. To proceed, shamefacedly hiding the struggle for reforms behind the pompous thesis of lending the economic struggle itself a political character, Martinoff advanced, as if it were a special point, exclusively economic, indeed, exclusively factory, reforms. As to the reason for his doing that, we do not know it carelessness, perhaps? Yet if he had in mind something else besides factory reforms, then the whole of his thesis, which we have cited, loses all sense. Perhaps he did it because he considers it possible and probable that the government will make concessions only in the economic sphere? 7. If so, then it is a strange delusion. Concessions are also possible and are made in the sphere of legislation concerning flogging, passports, land redemption payments, religious sects the censorship, etc., etc. Economic concessions, or pseudo-concessions, are, of course, the cheapest and the most advantageous from the government's point of view, because by these means it hopes to win the confidence of the working masses. For this very reason, we social democrats must not under any circumstances or in any way whatever create grounds for the belief, or the misunderstanding that we attach greater value to economic reforms, or that we regard them as being particularly important etc. Such demands, writes Martinov, speaking of the concrete demands for legislative and administrative measures referred to above, would not be merely a hollow sound, because, promising certain palpable results, they might be actively supported by the working masses. 
We are not economists, oh no. We only cringe as slavishly before the palpableness of concrete results as do the Bernsteins, the Prokopovishes, the Struves, the RMS, and Tutti Quanti. We only wish to make it understood, together with Nazi Stuparilov, that all which does not promise palpable results is merely a hollow sound. We are only trying to argue as if the working masses were incapable, and had not already proved their capabilities, notwithstanding those who ascribe their own philistinism to them, of actively supporting every protest against the autocracy, even if it promises absolutely no palpable results whatever. Let us take, for example, the very measures for the relief of unemployment and the famine that Martinov himself advances. Ray Bocciadiello is engaged, judging by what it is promised, in drawing up and elaborating a program of concrete, in the form of bills, demands for legislative and administrative measures, promising palpable results, while a scra, which constantly places the revolutionizing of dogma higher than the revolutionizing of life, has tried to explain the inseparable connection between unemployment and the whole capitalist system, has given warning that famine is coming, has exposed the police fight against the famine stricken, and the outrageous provisional penal servitude regulations, and Zaria has published a special reprint, in the form of an agitational pamphlet, of a section of its review of home affairs, dealing with the famine. 8. But good God! How unassided were these incorrigibly narrow and orthodox doctrinaires, how deaf to the calls of life itself! Their articles contained, oh horror, not a single, can you imagine it? Not a single concrete demand promising palpable results. Poor doctrine heirs. They ought to be sent to Krychevsky and Martinov to be taught that tactics are a process of growth, of that which grows, etc., and that the economic struggle itself should be given a political character. In addition to its immediate revolutionary significance, the economic struggle of the workers against the employers and the government, economic struggle against the government, has also this significance, it constantly brings home to the workers the fact that they have no political rights, Martinov, p. 44. We quote this passage, not in order to repeat for the hundredth and thousandth time what has been said above, but in order to express particular thanks to Martinov for this excellent new formula, the economic struggle of the workers against the employers and the government. What a gem! With what inimitable skill and mastery in eliminating all partial disagreements and shades of differences among economists this clear and concise proposition expresses the quintessence of economism, from summoning the workers to the political struggle, which they carry on in the general interest, for the improvement of the conditions of all the workers, 9, continuing through the theory of stages, and ending in the resolution of the conference on the most widely applicable etc. Economic struggle against the government is precisely trade unionist politics, which is still very far from being social democratic politics. b. How Martinov rendered Polekhanov more profound. What a large number of social democratic Lomonosovs have appeared among us lately. Observed a comrade one day, having in mind the astonishing propensity of many who are inclined toward economism to arrive, necessarily, by their own understanding, at great truths. For example, that the economic struggle stimulates the workers to ponder over their lack of rights, and in doing so to ignore, with the supreme contempt of born geniuses, all that has been produced by the antecedent development of revolutionary thought and of the revolutionary movement. Lomonosov Martinov is precisely such a born genius. We need but glance at his article Urgent Questions to see how by his own understanding he arrives at what was long ago said by Axelrod, of whom our Lomonosov, naturally, says not a word, how? For instance, he is beginning to understand that we cannot ignore the opposition of such or such strata of the bourgeoisie, Ray Bocciadiello, No. 9, pages 61, 62, 71, compare this with Ray Bocciadiello's reply to Axelrod, pages 22, 23, 24, etc. But alas, he is only arriving and is only beginning, not more than that, for so little has he understood Axelrod's ideas that had talks about the economic struggle against the employers and the government. For three years, 1898-1901, Ray Bocciadiello has tried hard to understand Axelrod, but has so far not understood him. Can one of the reasons be that social democracy, like mankind, always sets itself only tasks that can be achieved? But the Lomonosovs are distinguished not only by their ignorance of many things, that would be but half misfortune but also by their unawareness of their own ignorance. Now this is a real misfortune, 
and it is this misfortune that prompts them without further ado to attempt to render Pelekanif more profound. Much water, Lomonosov Martinov says, has flowed under the bridge since Pelekanif wrote his book, Tasks of the Socialists in the Fight Against the Famine in Russia. The Social Democrats who for a decade led the economic struggle of the working class, have failed as yet to lay down a broad theoretical basis for party tactics. This question has now come to a head, and if we should wish to lay down such a theoretical basis, we should certainly have to deepen considerably the principles of tactics developed at one time by Polekhanov. Our present definition of the distinction between propaganda and agitation would have to be different from Polekhanov's. Martinov has just quoted Pykhanov's words, a propagandist presents many ideas to one or a few persons, an agitator presents only one or a few ideas, but he presents them to a mass of people, by propaganda we would understand the revolutionary explanation of the present social system, entire or in its partial manifestations, whether that be done in a form intelligible to individuals or to broad masses. By agitation, in the strict sense of the word, sick, we would understand the call upon the masses to undertake definite, concrete actions and the promotion of the direct revolutionary intervention of the proletariat in social life. We congratulate Russian and international social democracy on having found, thanks to Martinov, a new terminology, more strict and more profound. Hitherto we thought, with Polekhanov, and with all the leaders of the international working class movement, that the propagandist, dealing with, say, the question of unemployment, must explain the capitalistic nature of crises, the cause of their inevitability in modern society, the necessity for the transformation of this society into a socialist society, etc. In a word, he must present many ideas, so many, indeed, that they will be understood as an integral whole only by a, comparatively, few persons. The agitator, however, speaking on the same subject, will take as an illustration a fact that is most glaring and most widely known to his audience, say, the death of an unemployed worker's family from starvation, the growing impoverishment, etc., and, utilizing this fact, known to all, will direct his efforts to presenting a single idea to the masses, for example, the senselessness of the contradiction between the increase of wealth and the increase of poverty. He will strive to rouse discontent and indignation among the masses against this crying injustice, leaving a more complete explanation of this contradiction to the propagandist. Consequently, the propagandist operates chiefly by means of the printed word, the agitator by means of the spoken word. The propagandist requires qualities different from those of the agitator. Kautsky and Lafargue, for example, we term propagandists, Bebel and Ghost we term agitators to single out a third sphere, or third function, of practical activity, and to include in this function the call upon the masses to undertake definite concrete actions, is sheer nonsense, because the call, as a single act, either naturally and inevitably supplements the theoretical treatise, propagandist pamphlet, and agitational speech, or represents a purely executive function. Let us take, for example, the struggle the German Social Democrats are now waging against the corn duties. The theoreticians write research works on tariff policy, with the call, say, to struggle for commercial treaties and for free trade. The propagandist does the same thing in the periodical press, and the agitator in public speeches. At the present time, the concrete action of the masses takes the form of signing petitions to the Reichstag against raising the corn duties. The call for this action comes indirectly from the theoreticians, the propagandists, and the agitators, and, directly, from the workers who take the petition lists to the factories and to private homes for the gathering of signatures. According to the Martinov terminology, Kautsky and Bebel are both propagandists, while those who solicit the signatures are agitators. Isn't it clear? The German example recalled to my mind the German word which, literally translated, means ball horning. Johann Ballhorn, a Leipzig publisher of the 16th century, published a child's reader in which, as was the custom, he introduced a drawing of a cock, but a cock without spurs and with a couple of eggs lying near it. On the cover he printed the legend, revised edition by Johann Ballhorn. Ever since then, the Germans describe any revision that is really a worsening as Ballhorning. And one cannot help recalling Ballhorn upon seeing how the Martinovs try to render Polekhanov more profound. Why did our Lomonosov invent this confusion? In order to illustrate how Iskra devotes attention only to one side of the case. Just as Plekleonov did a decade and a half ago, 39. With Iskra, 
propagandist tasks force agitational tasks into the background, at least for the present. 52. If we translate this last proposition from the language of Martinov into ordinary human language, because mankind has not yet managed to learn the newly invented terminology, we shall get the following, with Iskra, the tasks of political propaganda and political agitation force into the background the task of presenting to the government concrete demands for legislative and administrative measures that promise certain palpable results, or demands for social reforms, that is, if we are permitted once again to employ the old terminology of the old mankind not yet grown to Martinov's level. We suggest that the reader compare this thesis with the following tirade. What also astonishes us in these programs, the programs advanced by revolutionary social democrats, is their constant stress upon the benefits of workers' activity in parliament, non-existent in Russia, though they completely ignore. Thanks to their revolutionary nihilism, the importance of workers' participation in the legislative manufacturers' assemblies on factory affairs, which do exist in Russia, or at least the importance of workers' participation in municipal bodies. The author of this tirade expresses in a somewhat more forthright and clearer manner the very idea which Lomonosov Martinov discovered by his own understanding. The author is R. M. in the separate supplement to Reboche I. Mistel, p. 15. See political exposures and training in revolutionary activity. In advancing against Iskro his theory of raising the activity of the working masses, Martinov actually betrayed an urge to belittle that activity, for he declared the very economic struggle before which all economists grovel to be the preferable, particularly important, and most widely applicable means of rousing this activity and its broadest field. This error is characteristic, precisely in that it is by no means peculiar to Martinov. In reality, it is possible to raise the activity of the working masses only when this activity is not restricted to political agitation on an economic basis. A basic condition for the necessary expansion of political agitation is the organization of comprehensive political exposure. In no way except by means of such exposures can the masses be trained in political consciousness and revolutionary activity. Hence, activity of this kind is one of the most important functions of international social democracy as a whole, for even political freedom does not in any way eliminate exposures, it merely shifts somewhat their sphere of direction. Thus, the German party is especially strengthening its positions and spreading its influence, thanks particularly to the untiring energy with which it is conducting its campaign of political exposure. Working class consciousness cannot be genuine political consciousness unless the workers are trained to respond to all cases of tyranny, oppression, violence, and abuse, no matter what class is affected, unless they are trained, moreover, to respond from a social democratic point of view and no other. The consciousness of the working masses cannot be genuine class consciousness, unless the workers learn, from concrete, and above all from topical political facts and events to observe every other social class in all the manifestations of its intellectual, ethical, and political life, unless they learn to apply in practice the materialist analysis and the materialist estimate of all aspects of the life and activity of all classes, strata, and groups of the population. Those who concentrate the attention, observation, and consciousness of the working class exclusively, or even mainly, upon itself alone are not social democrats for the self-knowledge of the working class is indissolubly bound up, not solely with a fully clear theoretical understanding, or rather, not so much with the theoretical, as with the practical, understanding, of the relationships between all the various classes of modern society, acquired through the experience of political life. For this reason the conception of the economic struggle as the most widely applicable means of drawing the masses into the political movement, which our economists preach is so extremely harmful and reactionary in its practical significance. In order to become a social democrat, the worker must have a clear picture in his mind of the economic nature and the social and political features of the landlord and the priest, the high state official and the peasant, the student and the vagabond. He must know their strong and weak points, he must grasp the meaning of all the catchwords and sophisms by which each class and each stratum camouflages its selfish strivings and its real inner workings. He must understand what interests are reflected by certain institutions and certain laws and how they are reflected. But this clear picture cannot be obtained from any book. It can be obtained only from living examples and from exposures that follow close upon what is going on about us at a given moment, upon what is being discussed, in whispers perhaps, by each one in his own way. 
upon what finds expression in such and such events, in such and such statistics, in such and such court sentences, etc., etc. These comprehensive political exposures are an essential and fundamental condition for training the masses in revolutionary activity. Why do the Russian workers still manifest little revolutionary activity in response to the brutal treatment of the people by the police, the persecution of religious sects, the flogging of peasants, the outrageous censorship, the torture of soldiers, the persecution of the most innocent cultural undertakings, etc. Is it because the economic struggle does not stimulate them to this, because such activity does not promise palpable results, because it produces little that is positive? To adopt such an opinion, we repeat, is merely to direct the charge where it does not belong, to blame the working masses for one's own philistinism, or Bernsteinism. We must blame ourselves, our lagging behind the mass movement, for still being unable to organize sufficiently wide, striking, and rapid exposures of all the shameful outrages. When we do that, and we must and can do it, the most backward worker will understand, or will feel, that the students and religious sects, the peasants and the authors are being abused and outraged by those same dark forces that are oppressing and crushing him at every step of his life. Feeling that, he himself will be filled with an irresistible desire to react, and he will know how to hoot the censors one day, on another day to demonstrate outside the house of a governor who has brutally suppressed a peasant uprising, on still another day to teach a lesson to the gendarmes in surpluses who are doing the work of the Holy Inquisition, etc. As yet we have done very little, almost nothing to bring before the working masses prompt exposures on all possible issues. Many of us as yet do not recognize this as our bounden duty but trail spontaneously in the wake of the drab everyday struggle, in the narrow confines of factory life. Under such circumstances to say that Iskra displays a tendency to minimize the significance of the forward march of the drab everyday struggle in comparison with the propaganda of brilliant and complete ideas, Martinov, Op. Sit, p. 61 means to drag the party back, to defend and glorify our unpreparedness and backwardness. As for calling the masses to action, that will come of itself as soon as energetic political agitation, live and striking exposures come into play. To catch some criminal red-handed and immediately to brand him publicly in all places is of itself far more effective than any number of calls, the effect very often is such as will make it impossible to tell exactly who it was that called upon the masses and who suggested this or that plan of demonstration, etc. Calls for action, not in the general, but in the concrete, sense of the term can be made only at the place of action, only those who themselves go into action, and do so immediately, can sound such calls. Our business as social democratic publicists is to deepen, expand, and intensify political exposures and political agitation. A word in passing about calls to action. The only newspaper which prior to the spring events called upon the workers to intervene actively in a matter that certainly did not promise any palpable results whatever for the workers, that is, the drafting of the students into the army, was Iskra. Immediately after the publication of the order of January 11th, on drafting the 183 students into the army, Escra published an article on the matter, in its February issue, number 2, 10, and, before any demonstration was begun, forthwith called upon the workers to go to the aid of the students, called upon the people openly to take up the government's arrogant challenge. We ask, how is the remarkable fact to be explained that although Martinov talks so much about calls to action? and even suggests calls to action as a special form of activity. He said not a word about this call. After this, was it not sheer philistinism on Martinov's part to allege that Iskra was one-sided because it did not issue sufficient calls to struggle for demands promising palpable results? Our economists, including Ray Bocciadiello, were successful because they adapted themselves to the backward workers. But the social democratic worker, the revolutionary worker, and the number of such workers is growing, will indignantly reject all this talk about struggle for demands promising palpable results, etc., because he will understand that this is only a variation of the old song about adding a kopeck to the ruble. Such a worker will say to his counselors from Raybochaya Missal and Raybochidiello, you are busying yourselves in vain, gentlemen, and shirking your proper duties, by meddling with such excessive zeal in a job that we can very well manage ourselves. There is nothing clever in your assertion that the Social Democrats' task is to lend the economic struggle itself a political character, that is only the beginning. It is not the main task of the Social Democrats. 
for all over the world, including Russia, the police themselves often take the initiative in lending the economic struggle a political character, and the workers themselves learn to understand whom the government supports. 11. 11. The demand to lend the economic struggle itself a political character most strikingly expresses subservience to spontaneity in the sphere of political activity. Very often the economic struggle spontaneously assumes a political character, that is to say, without the intervention of the revolutionary bacilli, the intelligentsia, without the intervention of the class-conscious social democrats. The economic struggle of the English workers, for instance, also assumed a political character without any intervention on the part of the socialists. The task of the social democrats, however, is not exhausted by political agitation on an economic basis. Their task is to convert trade unionist politics into social democratic political struggle, to utilize the sparks of political consciousness which the economic struggle generates among the workers, for the purpose of raising the workers to the level of social democratic political consciousness. The Martinovs, however, instead of raising and stimulating the spontaneously awakening political consciousness of the workers, bow to spontaneity and repeat over and over ad nauseum, that the economic struggle impels the workers to realize their own lack of political rights. It is unfortunate, gentlemen, that the spontaneously awakening trade unionist political consciousness does not impel you to an understanding of your social democratic tasks. Lenin the economic struggle of the workers against the employers and the government about which you make as much fuss as if you had discovered a new America, is being waged in all parts of Russia, even the most remote, by the workers themselves who have heard about strikes, but who have heard almost nothing about socialism. The activity you want to stimulate among us workers, by advancing concrete demands that promise palpable results, we are already displaying and in our everyday, limited trade union work we put forward these concrete demands, very often without any assistance whatever from the intellectuals. But such activity is not enough for us, we are not children to be fed on the thin gruel of economic politics alone, we want to know everything that others know, we want to learn the details of all aspects of political life and to take part actively in every single political event. In order that we may do this, the intellectuals must talk to us less of what we already know. 12 and tell us more about what we do not yet know and what we can never learn from our factory and economic experience, namely, political knowledge. You intellectuals can acquire this knowledge, and it is your duty to bring it to us in a hundred and a thousandfold greater measure than you have done up to now, and you must bring it to us, not only in the form of discussions, pamphlets, and articles, which very often, pardon our frankness, are rather dull but precisely in the form of vivid exposures of what our government and our governing classes are doing at this very moment in all spheres of life. Devote more zeal to carrying out this duty and talk less about raising the activity of the working masses. We are far more active than you think, and we are quite able to support, by open street fighting, even demands that do not promise any palpable results whatever. It is not for you to raise our activity, because activity is precisely the thing you yourselves lack bow less in subservience to spontaneity, and think more about raising your own activity, gentlemen. d. What is there in common between economism and terrorism? In the last footnote we cited the opinion of an economist and of a non-social democratic terrorist, who showed themselves to be accidentally in agreement. Speaking generally, however, there is not an accidental, but a necessary, inherent connection between the two of which we shall have need to speak later, and which must be mentioned here in connection with the question of education for revolutionary activity. The economists and the root, namely, subservience to spontaneity, with which we dealt in the preceding chapter as a general phenomenon and which we shall now examine in relation to its effect upon political activity and the political struggle. At first sight, our assertion may appear paradoxical. So great is the difference between those who stress the drab everyday struggle and those who call for the most self-sacrificing struggle of individuals. But this is no paradox. The economists and the terrorists merely bow to different poles of spontaneity. The economists bow to the spontaneity of the labor movement pure and simple, while the terrorists bow to the spontaneity of the passionate indignation of intellectuals, who lack the ability or opportunity to connect the revolutionary struggle and the working class movement into an integral whole. It is difficult indeed for those who have lost their belief, or who have never believed, that this is possible, to find some outlet for their indignation and revolutionary energy other than terror. Thus, 
Both forms of subservience to spontaneity we have mentioned are nothing but the beginning of the implementation of the notorious Greedo program. Let the workers wage their economic struggle against the employers and the government. We apologize to the author of the Greedo for expressing her views in Martinoff's words. We think we have a right to do so since the Credo, too, says that in the economic struggle the workers come up against the political regime and let the intellectuals conduct the political struggle by their own efforts, with the aid of terror. Of course. This is an absolutely logical and inevitable conclusion which must be insisted on, even though those who are beginning to carry out this program do not themselves realize that it is inevitable. Political activity has its logic quite apart from the consciousness of those who, with the best intentions, call either for terror or for lending the economic struggle itself a political character. The road to hell is paved with good intentions, and, in this case, good intentions cannot save one from being spontaneously drawn along the line of least resistance, along the line of the purely bourgeois credo program. Surely it is no accident either that many Russian liberals, avowed liberals and liberals that wear the mask of Marxism, wholeheartedly sympathize with terror and try to foster the terrorist moods that have surged up in the present time. The formation of the revolutionary socialists forbode a group which set itself the aim of helping the working class movement in every possible way, but which included in its program terror, and emancipation, so to speak, from social democracy, once again confirmed the remarkable perspicacity of P. P. Axelrod who literally foretold these results of social democratic waverings as far back as the end of 1897, present tasks and tactics, when he outlined his famous two perspectives. All the subsequent disputes and disagreements among Russian social democrats are contained, like a plant in the seed, in these two perspectives. 13. From this point of view it also becomes clear why Ray Bocciadiello, unable to withstand the spontaneity of economism has likewise been unable to withstand the spontaneity of terrorism. It is highly interesting to note here the specific arguments that Svoboda has advanced in defense of terrorism. It completely denies the deterrent role of terrorism, the regeneration of revolutionism, p. 64, but instead stresses its excitative significance. This is characteristic, first, as representing one of the stages of the breakup and decline of the traditional, pre-social democratic, cycle of ideas which insisted upon terrorism. The admission that the government cannot now be terrified and hence disrupted, by terror, is tantamount to a complete condemnation of terror as a system of struggle, as a sphere of activity sanctioned by the program. Secondly, it is still more characteristic as an example of the failure to understand our immediate tasks in regard to education for revolutionary activity. Svoboda advocates terror as a means of exciting the working class movement and of giving it a strong impetus. It is difficult to imagine an argument that more thoroughly disproves itself. Are there not enough outrages committed in Russian life without special excitants having to be invented? On the other hand, is it not obvious that those who are not, and cannot be, roused to excitement even by Russian tyranny will stand by twiddling their thumbs and watch a handful of terrorists engaged in single combat with the government? The fact is that the working mass is aroused to a high pitch of excitement by the social evils in Russian life, but we are unable to gather if one may so put it, and concentrate all these drops and streamlets of popular resentment that are brought forth to a far larger extent than we imagine by the conditions of Russian life, and that must be combined into a single gigantic torrent. That this can be accomplished is irrefutably proved by the enormous growth of the working class movement and the eagerness, noted above, with which the workers clamor for political literature. On the other hand, Calls for terror and calls to lend the economic struggle itself a political character are merely two different forms of evading the most pressing duty now resting upon Russian revolutionaries, namely, the organization of comprehensive political agitation. Svoboda desires to substitute terror for agitation, openly admitting that as soon as intensified and strenuous agitation is begun among the masses the excitative function of terror will be ended, the regeneration of revolutionism, p. 68. This proves precisely that both the terrorists and the economists underestimate the revolutionary activity of the masses, despite the striking evidence of the events that took place in the spring, 14, and whereas the one group goes out in search of artificial excitants, the other talks about concrete demands. But both fail to devote sufficient attention to the development of their own activity in political agitation and in the organization of political exposures and no other work can serve as a substitute for this task either at the present time or at any other. e. The working class as vanguard fighter for democracy.
we have seen that the conduct of the broadest political agitation and, consequently, of all sided political exposures is an absolutely necessary and a paramount task of our activity, if this activity is to be truly social democratic. However, we arrived at this conclusion solely on the grounds of the pressing needs of the working class for political knowledge and political training. But such a presentation of the question is too narrow, for it ignores the general democratic tasks of social democracy, in particular of present-day Russian social democracy. In order to explain the point more concretely we shall approach the subject from an aspect that is nearest to the economist, namely, from the practical aspect. Everyone agrees that it is necessary to develop the political consciousness of the working class. The question is, how that is to be done and what is required to do it. The economic struggle merely impels the workers to realize the government's attitude towards the working class. Consequently, however much we may try to lend the economic, struggle itself a political character, we shall never be able to develop the political consciousness of the workers, to the level of social democratic political consciousness, by keeping within the framework of the economic struggle, for that framework is too narrow. The Martinov formula has some value for us, not because it illustrates Martinov's aptitude for confusing things, but because it pointedly expresses the basic error that all the economists commit, namely, their conviction that it is possible to develop the class political consciousness of the workers from within, so to speak, from their economic struggle, that is, by making this struggle the exclusive, or, at least, the main, starting point, by making it the exclusive, or, at least, the main, basis. Such a view is radically wrong. Piqued by our polemics against them, the economists refuse to ponder deeply over the origins of these disagreements, with the result that we simply cannot understand one another. It is as if we spoke in different tongues. Class political consciousness can be brought to the workers only from without, that is, only from outside the economic struggle, from outside the sphere of relations between workers and employers. The sphere from which alone it is possible to obtain this knowledge is the sphere of relationships of all classes and strata to the state and the government, the sphere of the interrelations between all classes. For that reason, the reply to the question as to what must be done to bring political knowledge to the workers cannot be merely the answer with which, in the majority of cases, the practical workers, especially those inclined towards economism, mostly content themselves, namely, to go among the workers. To bring political knowledge to the workers the social democrats must go among all classes of the population, they must dispatch units of their army in all directions. We deliberately select this blunt formula, we deliberately express ourselves in this sharply simplified manner, not because we desire to indulge in paradoxes, but in order to impel the economists to a realization of their tasks which they unpardonably ignore, to suggest to them strongly the difference between trade unionist and social democratic politics, which they refuse to understand. We therefore beg the reader not to get wrought up, but to hear us patiently to the end. Let us take the type of social democratic study circle that has become most widespread in the past few years and examine its work. It has contacts with the workers and rests content with this, issuing leaflets in which abuses in the factories, the government's partiality towards the capitalists, and the tyranny of the police are strongly condemned. At workers' meetings the discussions never, or rarely ever, go beyond the limits of these subjects. Extremely rare are the lectures and discussions held on the history of the revolutionary movement, on questions of the government's home and foreign policy, on questions of the economic evolution of Russia and of Europe, on the position of the various classes in modern society, etc. as to systematically acquiring and extending contact with other classes of society. No one even dreams of that. In fact, the ideal leader, as the majority of the members of such circles picture him, is something far more in the nature of a trade union secretary than a socialist political leader. For the secretary of any, say English, trade union always helps the workers to carry on the economic struggle, he helps them to expose factory abuses, explains the injustice of the laws and of measures that hamper the freedom to strike and to picket, i.e., to warn all and sundry that a strike is proceeding at a certain factory, explains the partiality of arbitration court judges who belong to the bourgeois classes, etc., etc. In a word, every trade union secretary conducts and helps to conduct the economic struggle against the employers and the government. It cannot be too strongly maintained that this is still not social democracy, that the social democrats' ideal should not be the trade union secretary, but the tribune of the people 
who is able to react to every manifestation of tyranny and oppression, no matter where it appears, no matter what stratum or class of the people it affects, who is able to generalize all these manifestations and produce a single picture of police violence and capitalist exploitation, who is able to take advantage of every event, however small, in order to set forth before all his socialist convictions and his democratic demands, in order to clarify for all and everyone the world historic significance of the struggle for the emancipation of the proletariat. Compare, for example, a leader like Robert Knight, the well-known secretary and leader of the Boiler Makers Society, one of the most powerful trade unions in England, with Wilhelm Liebknecht, and try to apply to them the contrasts that Martinoff draws in his controversy with Iskra. You will see, I am running through Martinoff's article, that Robert Knight engaged more in calling the masses to certain concrete actions, Martinoff, op. sit, p. 39, while Willie Elin Liebknecht engaged more in the revolutionary elucidation of the whole of the present system or partial manifestations of it, 38 39, that Robert Knight formulated the immediate demands of the proletariat and indicated the means by which they can be achieved, 41. Whereas Wilhelm Liebknecht, while doing this, did not hold back from simultaneously guiding the activities of various opposition strata, dictating a positive program of action for them, 15, 41, that Robert Knight strove as far as possible to lend the economic struggle itself a political character, 42, and was excellently able to submit to the government concrete demands promising certain palpable results, 43, whereas Liebknecht engaged to a much greater degree in one-sided exposures, 40, that Robert Knight attached more significance to the forward march of the drab everyday struggle, 61, whereas Liebknecht attached more significance to the propaganda of brilliant and completed ideas, 61, that Liebknecht converted the paper he was directing into an organ of revolutionary opposition that exposed the state of affairs in our country, particularly the political state of affairs insofar as it affected the interests of the most varied strata of the population, 63, whereas Robert Knight worked for the cause of the working class in close organic connection with the proletarian struggle, 63, if by close and organic connection is meant the subservience to spontaneity which we examined above, by taking the examples of Krychevsky and Martinov, and restricted the sphere of his influence, convinced, of course, as is Martinov, that by doing so he deepened that influence, 63. In a word, you will see that de facto Martinov reduces social democracy to the level of trade unionism, though he does so, of course, not because he does not desire the good of social democracy, but simply because he is a little too much in a hurry to render Polekhanov more profound, instead of taking the trouble to understand him. Let us return, however, to our theses. We said that a social democrat, if he really believes it necessary to develop comprehensively the political consciousness of the proletariat, must go among all classes of the population. This gives rise to the questions, how is this to be done? Have we enough forces to do this? Is there a basis for such work among all the other classes? Will this not mean a retreat, or lead to a retreat, from the class point of view? Let us deal with these questions. We must go among all classes of the population as theoreticians, as propagandists, as agitators, and as organizers. No one doubts that the theoretical work of social democrats should aim at studying all the specific features of the social and political condition of the various classes. But extremely little is done in this direction as compared with the work that is done in studying the specific features of factory life. In the committees and study circles, one can meet people who are immersed in the study even of some special branch of the metal industry, but one can hardly ever find members of organizations, obliged, as often happens, for some reason or other to give up practical work, who are especially engaged in gathering material on some pressing question of social and political life in our country which could serve as a means for conducting social democratic work among other strata of the population. In dwelling upon the fact that the majority of the present-day leaders of the working class movement lack training, we cannot refrain from mentioning training in this respect also, for it too is bound up with the economist conception of close organic connection with the proletarian struggle. The principal thing, of course, is propaganda and agitation among all strata of the people. The work of the West European Social Democrat is in this respect facilitated by the public meetings and rallies which all are free to attend, and by the fact that in Parliament he addresses the representatives of all classes. We have neither a Parliament nor freedom of assembly, nevertheless, 
we are able to arrange meetings of workers who desire to listen to a social democrat. We must also find ways and means of calling meetings of representatives of all social classes that desire to listen to a democrat, for he is no social democrat who forgets in practice that the communists support every revolutionary movement, that we are obliged for that reason to expound and emphasize general democratic tasks before the whole people, without for a moment concealing our socialist convictions. He is no social democrat who forgets in practice his obligation to be ahead of all in raising, accentuating, and solving every general democratic question. But everyone agrees with this. The impatient reader will exclaim, and the new instructions adopted by the last conference of the Union Abroad for the editorial board of Rebochidiello definitely say, all events of social and political life that affect the proletariat either directly as a special class or as the vanguard of all the revolutionary forces in the struggle for freedom should serve as subjects for political propaganda and agitation. Two conferences, p. 17, are italics. Yes, these are very true and very good words, and we would be fully satisfied if Rebochidiello understood them and if it refrained from saying in the next breath things that contradict them. For it is not enough to call ourselves the vanguard, the advanced contingent. We must act in such a way that all the other contingents recognize and are obliged to admit that we are marching in the vanguard. And we ask the reader, are the representatives of the other contingents such fools as to take our word for it when we say that we are the vanguard? Just picture to yourselves the following, a social democrat comes to the contingent of Russian educated radicals, or liberal constitutionalists, and says, we are the vanguard. The task confronting us now is, as far as possible, to lend the economic struggle itself a political character. The radical, or constitutionalist, if he is at all intelligent, and there are many intelligent men among Russian radicals and constitutionalists, would only smile at such a speech and would say, to himself, of course, for in the majority of cases he is an experienced diplomat. Your vanguard must be made up of simpletons. They do not even understand that it is our task. The task of the progressive representatives of bourgeois democracy to lend the workers' economic struggle itself a political character. Why, we too, like the West European bourgeois, want to draw the workers into politics, but only into trade and 